samples around to you. So I have two things for show and tell. So do you remember that I sent for Pat's great grandmother, Catherine Kilgallen's um, uh, probate? And it finally came. This is in Stark County, Ohio. And talk about the deal. They only charged me 10 cents a page to copy it. And I, I sent a self-stamped address envelope, but I know it costs more than what I put on it for postage. And I don't know whether they paid for that. But anyway, they only charged me, this was a 43 page probate and they charged me $4 and 30 cents. I was like, oh my God. And is this from, from the courts or? <laughs> from the courts, yeah. So it, and I asked for a full probate. I mean, sometimes they'll send you, you know, what they think are the key documents. So um, it has her will, it has uh, probate information, it has the um, appraisal, it has the return, or at least part of the return, it has the probate um, financial submission, it's just got everything. But what I especially wanted to get it was to figure out how she addressed the whole thing of her uh, husband. This is the one where Edward Kilgallen isn't around the family. Right. Um, he's, they're, they're together in the 1900 census, at the 1910 census, he's not with the family in Cannonsburg, um, Ohio, Pennsylvania. In 1920, she's moved to Ohio, Stark County. He then shows up in, in 1920 in Cannonsburg. I don't know where he was in 1910. In 1930, she's already deceased. He does, I don't find him in 1930 again, but in 1935, he's um, in a, a city directory in Miami living with one of his sons and then he dies in Miami in 1936. So he's well alive and in 1920, she's in, like I said, uh, Stark County, Ohio, and he's in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. And they're not like real close, but they're not way far apart either. You know, they're kind of on either side of the Ohio River inland a little. Um, but in her, pro, pro, her will, she leaves it to her eight children or her surviving children. But the probate in three different places says there is no surviving widower. And yet he is, he is alive. alive. He was over him. <laughs> I was, guess. They weren't divorced? Well, I, you know, somebody else mentioned that. That I know of, no, because in his, in his 18, I think, or 1920 census, I believe it was, he says he's married. And what does and her say? And she says she's a widow. So you not the divorce. divorce files? I didn't, but they, they don't say they're divorced. I mean, they she says she's a widow. In fact, one of the city directories, she says widow of Edward Kilgallen. So did she think he was dead? And he was living elsewhere? And she didn't know? I don't know. You said they were close enough that they could have met up at a grocery store accidentally? No, no. they weren't that, not that close. And could he have that. abandoned her and she really thought she, he was dead? That's possible. Except for that he shows up then in Cannonsburg where they live. I mean, how would that not be somehow? The what year was that? Pardon me? When he shows up in the thing, was that what year? 20, 1920. But on her 1920 census, she says she's widowed. Yeah. So could she have filled out the census thing saying she's widowed and then run into him somewhere? Or do we, we don't know they ran into each other. No. Or she could have said because that was more socially acceptable than divorced. Yeah. Well, maybe. I or mean, abandoned? I think separated, but maybe it's abandoned. Just odd that he says married and she says widowed. Well, 1920. Somebody's lying. Yeah. Or maybe, so, like I said, she thinks she was, he's missing and that he's just might as well be dead. He's dead to her. In 1926 is when the probate, and that's where 
is like I said, three different places. Um, let's see. Get my. Was she? Is there some? Would there be some advantage to saying you were widowed? That's what I'm thinking too. Was she nineteen twenty? Getting any kind of compensation, or was she involved with somebody? That it would have been more difficult if you were just estranged. I don't see that. I see what she did do in both Cannonsburg and then in Canton, Stark County, is she had a um, boarding house. Um, and she, somehow she made good money because she had like, I don't know, a couple of different places I've read it, but like $8,000 probate. And she had property she owned and stocks and a bunch of things. Maybe she, do you think she, was it stuff that wasn't in his team? She was trying to make sure she had sole rights to it? I don't know. You know, Maybe he that, runs off, you make money, then he comes back because he wants some of your money and says, it's, you know, we share. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although, like I said, they weren't living together. Um, and I do have her uh, in city directories. I'd have to look again. But both in or, um, Cannonsburg and Canton, and in all of them, either she's a widow or you know there's no Edward around. And what was the thirty census, Cindy? The thirty census, she's deceased. She dies in twenty six. I don't find him in the thirty census, and um, I know where two of his sons are, and he's not with them. I think I know where the third son is, and he's not with him. It's possible he's with one of the daughters that I just haven't explored yet. But he, this is in, the 19... 1930. 1930. So she, she dies before the Depression. Right before yes. 26. Yeah. Yes. And so, and, but in 35, he's in Miami, alive. and dies. Florida or Ohio? Pardon me? Miami, Florida, or Miami, Ohio? Florida, Miami, Florida. So like you live in a good life, you're forced to work yeah. with and support the kids, and yeah, I. It's just, I mean, her her will doesn't say anything, but the, remember, she's dad at the probate, so these are other people, her children, who are saying there was no widow or what year oh, was her will? The will was twenty two. Well, that would make sense if in 1920 she put down that she was a widow. Right. 22, she writes out her will and says, I'm still a widow. Yeah. And well, it doesn't say that on the will. It doesn't say anything about a widow on the will. It just oh, says, really? I believe it, to my surviving children. Okay. Well, she obviously didn't have a man in the picture when she wrote yeah. the will in 22. Right. So, wait, wait. Does the will say in 1922? that that okay she just leaves it to her children right. but it doesn't say anything about an ex-husband or a um no survivor nothing about if that he to, if he was alive and she wanted to exclude him she would have to name she him. would write that i yeah. think especially if she especially if there wasn't a divorce so if he had abandoned her then in 19 and she knew he was abandoning her whether she wrote widow or not in 1920 she would have, she would have said i am leaving this to my children and and name the children and to my estranged husband zero zero or you know 50 cents or he can yeah. get you know an old rusty cup or something but so since she didn't say that then she was either very divorced knew she was divorced mm -hmm. or she really did believe he was dead and, and therefore told everybody else that. No, let me ask you a question, Cindy. Yeah. You found him in 1935 in Miami? Yes, Florida. And you're positive and you're sure it's him. Yeah. Yes, he's living in the home of his son. And he dies and it's him with all the right ages and everything in the... the um... And how old was he in 36 when he died? Gosh, uh, he was born in 50, 60, 60, uh, 80, I think, not quite 80, something like that. I like these puzzles, these are fun. 
Yeah, so it's it's quite a mystery. Now I I can't find it quickly here. So the kids must have known he was alive after twenty two, or at least no, in twenty six. There, with all the probate is saying, or no. stuff gets tough. You know, the depression hits. Stuff gets tough for him. He, she's already gone, and he reaches out to the kids who think yeah. that he's dead, but not because he needs. Oh my gosh, dad's depression. not dead. Yeah, and he's older in the depression. He was in, like in his seventies. So he probably didn't have a lot of prospects if he didn't have property on his own or whatever, wherever he went. That's a lot of forgiveness. Those kids took him in. Yeah. M must have really felt bad for him. All the remainder of my state after bills and things, et cetera. Or maybe um, she was a piece of work. She had to, to, it. Him to my children. And the kids are pretty close. Doesn't say anything about a spouse one way or the other. And did you find him in 1920? Yes, he's the one. I found him in 1920 in Cannonsburg. So nearish town. The, yes, sort of nearish. I don't know. And what's he doing for a living? A minor, I think. A minor. We said I would. Sure, I would check the divorce rules. You would check what? The divorce rules. Yeah, I, in those I, counties to see if I guess I didn't think so because of the fact that divorce was never put on the census for well, either of them. But right, but divorce is worse than widowed, right? Yeah, let him be dead. Stigma in 1920. Yeah, okay. they're Catholic, right? Well, I don't know if they're Catholic. They came from Irish backgrounds, so they might be presumably, but. Pat's grandmother, you know, their daughter, wasn't Catholic. She was Protestant or nothing? Episcopalian or something. Oh, that's kind of Catholic Almost, light. Yeah. Catholic, Catholic light, light. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, how well, that thing? Um, I either they were divorced, or she really thought he was dead, and then yeah. after her death, he appears again, especially after the depression. That's what it sounds. Or, like. or she wanted nothing to do with him, and the easiest thing was to do was to say widowed. Do you think yeah. people would lie? I mean, to the census taker, what's it? To the, I mean, really? I don't know. It seems very official. I think it would scare a lot of people. It's not under oath. It's not. And if yeah. that's what you're telling everyone, if that's your. Uh, oh, I have an idea. Who is, who is the information giver on the census? That's what I really are on the same wavelength. <laughs> I was just going to say, on the census, did she give the information, or was it like an el older child or something? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, what what census that. was it? Was it the forties that puts the little? We we figured out that it puts a circle or something, or an H or something. Yeah, both of them are dead by forty. So, no, but I think it was it, even earlier than that. They marked who was the the giver. In for it. was she? I don't know the answer for twenty. Yeah, in 20, there were a couple of her children living there, but in 20 for him, he was on his own. And he put, if she, he was, if she was a dating a border, it probably sounded a lot better to be widowed. I'm a, yeah. <laughs> but I don't think there was, well, I don't know. I'll have to look again. She would have been in her 50s. She was born in 57. So. Oh, so she'd be in her 70s in 1920. Uh, she'd be 60. Oh, she wouldn't. I was born in 57. Yeah, how old are you? She'd be in her 60s. <laughs> yeah. So she's yeah. a hot mama with yeah, some money. I, so she'd have all sorts of men hanging after her. Anyway, I thought that was really interesting. So um, the other quick thing is, you know how I went to one of the Southern California Genealogy Society things about jurisdiction explained and it um, rather quickly turned into let me show you how to do um, family search so I was like okay but she did make one valid point you know in family search Mary I know you've done this where you, you look for your country and it gives a bunch of information about what the county system looks like or whatever thing and what the language and this and that and the other thing. And she was saying that when you're into a new area or an area you're stuck in, you make your own, um, what did they call it? 
Let me see. Locality guide. Mm -hmm. And put just, just study like that county, when it was formed, what county it came from, um, what kind of records are available, the religion, the just whatever. And that, that might help you, especially if you're stuck. So that I thought was actually a half a decent idea. Um, she also reminded me or reminded us that there is a library called the Newberry Library in Chicago. And it has, and it's online stuff, a resource that shows the development of county lines over time. And you know how I've got that one book I always look up and see what the county lines are. Well, this takes it year by year by year as opposed to mine, which is by census by census. So anyway, um, I'll show it to you real quick. If I can bring it up. Oh, I have to do this, don't I? Okay, wait, I have to do share screen. Oh, Susan, I just had a brainstorm. Okay. If you can't find tile that matches exactly, but it's close, you could run it on the diagonal in that room after the transition strip. And you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference because you would just think it was the way the light was hitting it. You know, run it. It's an idea. Okay, so this is yeah. the Newberry Library. <laughs> You're thinking about my title. <laughs> Digital. <laughs> Shut up. And this is the thing I wish they were talking about. Atlas of Historical County Boundaries. So it's new, the Newberry Library and Digital Newberry. That's the, the keys. So let's see if I can, I, I did it yesterday, but that doesn't mean I can do it today. You can do it, Cindy. <sighs> I know you can. Okay, so we'll pick Ohio because that's Oh, I look at my key. Okay, really? interactive map. So this is like in 1803. This is what the counties look like. So. It's not sharing. Are you thinking you're sharing? Yeah. No. Oh, I pressed the share button. It oh. Press it harder. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me try this again. Um, well, how about this? Share. There it goes. But now we see your desktop. Yeah. Back up your computer. <laughs> yeah. There's there's that. But now how do I bring up what I was looking at? Well, when you uh, share the screen, it should tell you what it should give you some options of which screen. Oh, oh okay. But you should be able to find it there. It's probably there, one of these. Which one are you looking at? Roots Magic, Word, Google. No, I'm looking at right that. So anyway, there it goes. Okay. There's All right. Class. So this is Ohio in 1803. What the county looked like. March first. Okay. So over in here is where your counties were. Yeah. I think. And then, and in Hamilton and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but and when did they come? About 1830, something like that. Yeah. Amberly, come yeah. on, you remember? Yeah. Oh, really. see, so you can go down and see how there's all these more counties. Yeah, wow. See, so here's yep. Fayette County, here's Green. I know that's one. Wow, so they consolidated, here. huh? Yeah. Well, no, but, but as there was more population, it divided more. No, I'm talking about by 1830, it's big, big pieces. Right. So 18, 1803. 18, 1803 is when it becomes a state. Oh, oh, no, it did. Okay. So I, I so thought that's subdivided and subdivided. So, like, you could look here and you could look in, say, 1807 and see, see they've already begun to become right. smaller. As how, how far does that go to? How, let's see, probably 1888. 1888. Why did it stop there? Maybe because that's what present day kind of looks like. So here's where you'd see here's green. 
And, but you had another one around here somewhere. Franklin. Clark, Clark, you had Green, Clark County yeah. across this. Yeah, you had people there and there. And then Hamilton, I know I remember. Anyway, so this is something to look at if you're interested and, and you can pick any state. So I just put it there yes. for you to view. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking at a current map right now and it sure looks about the same. Yeah, I think I think it probably goes to the point. They probably just move boundaries just a little bit, you know. All right, how do I unshare? I go back. Oh, there's my email. I know. <laughs> I try to figure out how to unshare something. It's a big red box. It's probably the top. Oh, there it is. This is stop share. Okay. Okay. So those were my show and tell. Mary, why don't you go next? I'm dying to hear what happened. Frozen Mary. Frozen Mary. Oh dear. Still frozen. Maybe turn yeah. off your video so that you can actually speak to us. Oh. What? Now you're moving. She said, yeah. oh, no, my internet is so bad. Like I hardly, um, I apologize. I hardly heard like the first half of Cindy's conversation. Good thing we're recording this then. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, so, Mary. No, there's no new, no new news. I just been really. really Mary, if you can hear us, turn off your video, and that'll make it so we can hear you. Stop. Turn turn your video off. Mary? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, turn <laughs> your video. It's so bad. Turn your video off. Okay, now you should be able to talk to us easier. Yes. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, other than that, nothing. It's just saying my network bandwidth is low and it just every like two minutes or so it's like crap. Are you still having serious uh, rain and problems over there? And no, no, we don't we don't get like a lot of rain. We're like in a particular part of North Carolina where we don't get a lot. We're like literally in this bowl. And everything oh. around us, it'll go around us or start like right where we end. And it just decimates the rest of the county. I'm, wow. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're, lucky. <laughs> we're lucky, but at the same time, we don't get as much rainfall. Yeah. I want to look at a map. What city are you so, in? Bay. We're in Fayetteville. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I, we're over on the, the west side. <clears throat> out near Rayford and we're in the sand hills. And when I say like, hopefully we'll get some rain this month coming up. So we really haven't been getting enough to. Uh, That's crazy when you think of everything around you. Are you in public land? There are like, when the hurricanes came through, yeah, we did get rain, but it wasn't as bad. Like we weren't underwater. There were like, literally like three, four miles away that were underwater. Are you, are you near Fort Bragg? Yeah, we're like seven miles outside of Fort Bragg. So you are in Pope Field? Uh, that's a, a, Pope Field is part of, used to be Pope Air Force Base. And now it's just Pope Army Airfield because they still do flying missions and stuff because they're airborne. We're right next to Rayford. Rayford. That's to the west. Rayford. How would you spell that? R A E F O R D. Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> oh. You're way over there. You're a city away from you're you're not in Rock Fayetteville. You're near Fayetteville. But you're Silver City, 
Rayford. Yeah, we're yeah, we're closer to Rayford. Like we're in Fayetteville, but we're almost more so considered Rayford. Oh, and that's you, that's if considered. You're at a, if you're looking at a real map, yeah, of Fayetteville, and you see uh, 95 and 295. I see Pearl one. And then there's a 295 outer loop that goes around Fort Bragg. We're on the back side of Fort Bragg. Those don't even look close together. I'm on Google Maps. <laughs> Fort Bragg. And Rayford are a long ways away from each other. How interesting. So yeah, you're really inland from from the ocean. Yeah, we yeah we're about two hours away. Uh, we're about two hours away from the mountains. We're like in this the sand hill. We're like in a divot, and our weather is so different. Even from like Raleigh Durham, mm -hmm. which is north of us, they'll get slammed with like snow and rain, and we don't get nothing. Hmm. Like yeah. So and we're hoping, you know, hurricane, we're, we're ready. You're ready. <laughs> I'm say, we're ready. Ready. We're ready. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I thought I you were so. closer to the water for some reason. I don't know why. No. So Mary, you, you've got your book and you have begun to scan things or begun to look at them or. Um, I, started taking pictures of them with, I have a, a separate, um, I had a Canon DSLR that I'm borrowing from my son. So I'm taking, I took pictures of every, every page. Of okay. It. Yeah. But I just haven't taken it apart yet um, or haven't scanned anything. Um, I, like I said, I just haven't had the time. Yeah. It's just been, I've been so, so busy. But you said something in your text about having contact with your. Oh, second. so I, I did speak to uh, Kimberly, the one, she's my second cousin on Jed Match. Yes. That recently emailed me, and now we started uh, a text communication with each other, phone. Uh -huh. but our communication is very like it's a long time in between communications because. She's really busy. And so I told her, I was like, look, I'm gonna, I told her that, you know, the album that I got and whatnot, and I wanted to send her emails of the pictures so she could show her grandmother, you know, and maybe she could let me know who some of these people are. Isn't, isn't the grandmother in her nineties? Yeah. So, okay. So, um, like I said, yeah, that's about, about it. Does she see her grandmother a lot? I mean, like, does she live in her house? They live together? I don't, she, I like, don't think they, yeah, I don't think they live, um, they don't live together, no. Okay, so maybe you should give her a, you should ask her, when do you think you're going to see grandma again? And then that will give you a date that'll maybe say, I need to have this done by Picture. September, whatever, because she's going to be going to see grandma on that day or so, you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause I, I had told her, I said, there are pictures that have like a lot of people, just like 25, 30 people, like, you know, um, so maybe she could start. So, so yeah, I do. Oh. That's exciting. Well, we, Look forward to yeah here. yeah very curious okay who's next Tamberly <laughs> I've done I've done nada because I've been nose deep in other projects but I did get on a little bit this morning um, just playing around and my great great grandmother that was married to the Harrison that was the immigrant that I could never. I had some ideas of maybe who her family was, but that was a dead end for me. Um, there was an ancestry hint, and I don't know if I, if I couldn't find it or I never looked for it, but to find a grave, 
that then had a link, which you never know if they've linked up the right person, but a link to her mother. So I have a possible maiden name of this her great mother? great grandmother's mother. We're, but I thought you said the great grandmother was the immigrant. So the so no, the great great grandfather was the immigrant, but his wife was a was oh. not an immigrant. She was a resident. She was an American. Right, but a name like Eliza Richards, you know, there's that's not unusual. But this is the first thing that I've seen something that links her to somebody else. And what does it say? Well, it just has Finch's, a, a Catherine Finch's a possible mother's name. Now it came up as a you know mother of on find a grave, so you really have to you know research it to see if it's correct. But at least it gave me something a name I've never heard before. Because then if I can figure that out, then I can maybe figure out who her parents were. And I can go through and see if there was a Catherine Finch that married a somebody Harrison or Richards that then might be her father. Then I can confirm those censuses to see, to figure out who she was. What part of the world is this? Ohio. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Damn Damn it, they're all, I think Mary's the only one that doesn't have a bunch of Ohio connections, is that right? But these are the guys yeah. that died, died young and left the two underage orphans, so. He's like the, the one who died, who left underage orphans? Yeah. I don't remember that. What's that? Yeah, with the, and the, the, the son was my great grandfather and the daughter was the one that was institutionalized. Oh. It's her. You haven't figured that out. Well, I haven't figured the mother, I, I didn't know who she was other than a maiden name. So now I can maybe, if I can figure out who her mother was, I might be able to link them. So that's my big, other than getting a new project on my loom. Wow. Oh, that's exactly what you needed. <laughs> I still think you should come and help me tile. <laughs> when are you tiling? A couple of weeks. Yeah, probably. I'll help you. Okay. I will, you guys got witnesses and I'm recording this. <laughs> <laughs> I bring my own tools. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so you're done? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got, I guess two things. They're, they're weird. Uh, one was my aunt in Arkansas, who's fully vaccinated, got sick and, with oh. COVID. And she was hospitalized for nine days. Can you believe oh. it? Wow. She went to a funeral, her pastor's funeral, and the church was packed and people weren't wearing masks. And can you believe it? And, and how so I guess you? she took her mask off for nobody's going to say, but I guess she would be too embarrassed to tell me. But um, she 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 got COVID. Her husband got COVID and 16 people in the church got COVID. Okay. And so she's the only one that ended up having to be hospitalized. But she said this, they had her, the, the hospital was packed and they had her in a observation room for days and there's no bathroom there. Because she's in her 80s or 90s? 84. So she met it. She's, she's just, she says, calls COVID evil. <laughs> yeah. Evil. It's just evil. <laughs> oh. So she's full, she was fully vaccinated, one of the first to get vaccinated. So anyway, she's just, just anyway. So that just made me realize I don't have the emails or phone numbers for any of her daughters and her daughters are my age. So it really oh. ticked me off because I didn't, you know, I was, my sister and I and my aunt Peggy, we, we email each other every few weeks, just letting each other know what's going on. And my sister and I were emailing each other and Peggy never said anything. And we just thought, oh, well, you know, she doesn't always say something. Finally, she emailed. She goes, I've been in the hospital for nine days and I'm, you know, with COVID. And she just gave it this like two sentence thing. And I was like, what? Oh. <laughs> so I tried calling my aunt and she wouldn't answer the phone. And it was so it made me say, oh, man, I don't have anybody's emails or phone numbers. And yeah. it really bothered me because, you know, what are you supposed to do if it She's 84. I want to be able to get in contact with people. So I did. Well, they might not have yours. And that's right. Of course yeah. they don't. Well, she was in the hospital for nine days and nobody thought to call me. So I am. Um, I'm Facebook friends with a first cousin who's just about six years younger than I am. And, you know, these all these kids, again, they're all raised together. They all know each other really well. Susan, who is a same but first cousin, 
she's in California, you know, I, yeah. I, we're the last spot over here. And so um, I did get a hold of a cousin that I've tenuously been keeping in touch with over the last few years on Facebook. Every once in a while, I go to her page and like something just so she remembers I'm still alive. And um, she, uh, so her and I were talking over Facebook and that was great. And just like what Mary said, you know, that you're, you're talking to somebody by email. Sometimes it's a little far, in, you know, with the contact, but you really, they have information you really want. And you're like, <laughs> Can you, I, I really want that information. So it was, it was interesting. I mean, and I still don't have phone numbers because I asked, because I call my aunt on the phone and she's doing better, but they're not great. And uh, she says, I said, when you feel better, can you please get me this contact information for your daughters? So I don't have anything. And, yeah. and that other first cousin, if I asked her, I'm sure she'd probably be able to get it. Yeah. Because, but that was, that was an interesting wow. thought that even our very closest relatives, the first cousins, we didn't have contact with each other. Wow. So here, here we are, all of four of us are trying to do first contact yeah. with great, great greats and and you know family stories are being lost and forgotten and we don't even know the basics like you know in cindy's case did this great grandmother divorce or yeah but it what happened you know did she think he was dead you know <laughs> these basic stories are gone so um that was the first story second thing is um and it's a kind of a off the topic thing but i thought it was interesting maybe you guys would like to hear is that you know i'm doing this jerry anders project and the people you meet the characters you meet are always so interesting i'm at 1976 and i find all these really awesome letters that are written and i'm trying not to read letters and i'll just show you briefly just quickly it's it's a beautiful text i don't know if you can see that it's print it's oh, wow. like block text yeah. so it's these beautiful letters with dates on the top, which are amazing. And they're just neatly written on lined paper with blocker lettering. So of course that's, I'm, my eye goes right to that. And I want to read those letters. I'm like, oh, this looks interesting. So I sit down in my nice comfy chair and there's about seven of them, all these letters all gathered up that Jerry had, that looked like Jerry had um, put together for some reason. So, okay. I don't know who this person is. I have no idea. His name is Ron Wakefield. No relation to the, I hope, to the uh, autism guy, uh, the uh, anti-vax guy. But so I'm reading these letters and he's writing them from prison. Oh. I'm thinking, what's this? You know, I don't know who he is. I don't know if he's, a, I don't think he's a relative because remember I've done all the family history and it, and it turns out that he's writing to Jerry and asking jerry favors and jerry's doing all this stuff for this guy like uh do an illusion and get me out of here <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm like is this a magician so it turns out that um he he says in his letter he turned himself in in salem oregon and that when he turned himself in he also turned in a whole bunch of uh, like his his luggage um uh, his car was sitting there so he checked himself into the police and i'm like what the heck is this and i asked mark and he goes it doesn't ring a bell to me you know what did he do well that's what i'm thinking so they're having this conversation this guy is really logical he he writes not only like beautiful perfect block lettering with dates on things but everything's detailed he'll make long letters long things of you know, could you go and pay for my PO box? Here's the, I will give you the money, but if you'll renew my PO box, will you renew the subscription to the newspaper I have? Here's, I will send you the money. You know, I think he gave Jerry like a equivalent to a hundred dollars or something and said, and gave him a list of all the things he wanted him to do, you know, renew subscriptions and things like that. And I guess Jerry took care of everything. And it was, I thought, I've never heard of this man. What's the relationship between them? That's what I'm trying to figure out. So, so I, I couldn't figure it out. I asked uh, uh, my friend who's, who owns all this property, who really is the property. She goes, I don't know who this guy is. I never heard of him. And 
Um, he's exchanging letters with Jerry and the, he's obviously really well read. He's very much into science. He would, he would say, oh, I was reading Scientific American and, and he'd draw little, little things of things that he saw in Scientific American about some space thing. And, and he would- that kind um, of lettering is kind of, you know, architect, engineer. You would think, yeah. Kind of, yeah. And I don't know if this guy's old or young. I don't know anything at this point. So um, I thought, interesting fellow um the the letters like i said you just read through them very quickly because they're so easy to read and so then i went on to newspaper.com and i found him and i was so excited so he he made so many references to tv and uh in the letters he's writing to to jerry he sounded like he's in prison he said at one point it's not that bad you know but he was always saying stuff like he said something like have you seen Star Wars yet? <laughs> and you're like, oh man, this is the 70s. Huh? And he said, um, like another one was, did you, um, uh, 2001, you know, a space odyssey. And he was talking about that. So it was just, so he's hearing all this stuff and he's knowing what's going on. So what ends up happening is uh, newspapers.com, I found the guy and it turns out that he was like two, 28 years old and he was these people one of these people shows up at your school board meetings and your and your and your um city council meetings yeah. and sits there and he was recording all the city council meetings he was very much into the recording broadcasting stuff cable tv and he's trying to he was recording everything and they were um because that's before they had free access to stuff and he was like a environmental activist sort of but anyway, he just was, you know, I could just see him being a pain in the ass kind of guy, oh, yeah. you know, and really annoying. But what he did is, I guess, in Salem or Albany, they purchased a television station. And he was really upset about it because I think he thought it would cost too much or they weren't. There was some problem with it. And he was trying to make people aware of the problem with this purchase of this TV station. So what he did is he went in, I guess it's a tower, a giant tower, and they have these giant wires that connect the tower. He clipped the wires. He clipped so the, the tower guy fell over. Did about $100,000 of damage. Oh, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> and then he walked in and checked himself in at the Salem, at the Salem Police Department. They didn't even know the tower had fallen down. He was like, I take full responsibility for this, but <laughs> they How gave long him did he serve? five years is what he was given. No other priors. And um, he had five years. So I saw the letters from 1975, 1976, 77. I mean, cause I'm sorting ahead of time and I want to see what's going on with this guy. So I'm sort I'm going through and looking at it and then I get ahead of myself because I want to know what happens to the guy, even though I'm not up to 1978 or 79 yet. And I go through the newspapers.com and it turns out he's, he's released in 1978. All of a sudden he's appearing at school board meetings and, and city council meetings again. So um, I guess he was released early and cause he was sentenced in 77, I think. So mm -hmm. in 78, he's out. And the, the city was, they had some guy, some con, some business, some large business that was dumping ammonia into the Willamette River. Oh, yeah. And so they wanted to, you can dump a certain amount. So he, this company was trying to like escalate it by, you know, triple the amount of ammonia that they could, they could dump in the river. And so environmentalists are like, that's not good. And others are like, oh no, if we don't let them do this, then we're going to lose this job, this company and the company's going to, we're going to lose jobs and stuff like that. So he was fighting against that really interesting guy. So then I fast forward and I find his name again, killed himself, 30 oh. years old. He drowned himself in the Willamette river. Wow. And that was okay. that. And then the next time I see him mentioned, there's a couple, uh, 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 a school board member is talking about it. And he's like, this guy was amazing. We need more people like that. I don't like his tactics, but yeah. you know, we really need it. And it just was so sad. Just a little because, touched. Yeah. Yeah. And that yeah. was the end of that. And I thought, gosh, how sad, you know, this is such an interesting character. And 
I couldn't find him on, uh, I found him on Ancestry. So I know when he was born and I can't find like a, a obituary or a, you know, family history or huh. anything. And I thought just, just was sad. But anyway, so in this world I'm living in, you just drop into somebody's life and, and, and you learn about them for a while and then they gone. It was so yeah, sad. I wonder, it was like 30 the, I wonder what the connection was. They lived in the same town. Well, here's a famous person. So I'm just going to start writing to you and ask you to do stuff for me. Well, Jerry wasn't famous in 1978. I mean, he was in the magic world, but he wasn't. Huh. He wasn't yet all on TV and stuff. He was yeah. just huh. some eccentric in town. So I'm sure they had a lot. The other eccentric, yeah. The other eccentric. <laughs> so that was my show, show and tell. It's just huh. like dropped in on this guy's life found out about it and dropped out <laughs> dropped out yeah and it's just sad and I'm, I'm running across those kinds of things and it's a fascinating look at human nature and how we connect to each other and yeah anyway okay okay well um before I get into my little presentation here um, I thought I might update you on the whole vision thing, the surgery. I had surgery Monday um, for the, and the doctor put a shunt in my eye to help the fluids in the eye. Right. Get out. Because it, you know, pressure was there and it was um, getting too high and tried medical things. He tried the flushing thing. And he said, you know, he, he, between the drops and this one pill I was taking, he's done everything he can do that way. Why is so it needs to be the shut now. So he put it in. Um, I was away mostly, but sort of in a far away place. Um, and it went well. And then I saw him the next day and the pressure, as you recall, it was 62, 40 something, 39, 26. You know, and then back up to 39. Anyway, it was somewhere between eight and 10. So <gasps> big wow. drop. That was the yeah. day after. Yes, the day and after. That's even below where it should be, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, he took me off of all of my usual glaucoma medicine and the diuretic I was taking because you don't want it to get too low. That's not good yeah. either. So, um, and normally how they set it up is you see the doctor the day after the surgery and then maybe two weeks later and so but he wanted to see me in a week so I see him next Tuesday because I'm so unpredictable and unique so that's uh, nice to be unique, <laughs> and unique and so, I don't know if you want to be unique for this but no <laughs> so the the little bit that my vision was creeping along improving dropped but now it seems to be back, and, but it fluctuates. The only negative of this is that I have to take um, prednisone, it's a steroid. Oh, and yeah. I was taking it four times a day. Now I have to take it every two hours, all day long. Ugh. And Just if I'm awake- for get a nice time. round face, yeah. And if I'm awake in the middle of the night, um, I don't have to wake up to do it, but if I like get up to go to the bathroom or something, that I'm supposed to take it also. Can you so give yourself Pat, drops again? Pardon me? Are, can you give yourself drops or is Pat having to wake up? Pat needs to do it still. Um, although in the middle of the night, I, I did manage it. There's there's some vision. I, if you will notice, I put my pirate patch back on my glasses because I am getting some vision and I'm trying to close this eye and because it's, you know, they're not good together. So the pirate patch is helping the left eye be able to open easy. But yeah, I'm, I'm getting, it's swollen up the eye, but anyway, Pat will be in in a couple of minutes to do the drops. In fact, maybe I'll have him come in early and then I can get going on on this without the interruptions. Hold on, let me go see what Pat's up to. Hey, Pat. Okay, good moment for me to take a quick bathroom break and I'll be right back. Yeah. You want to go out there? 
Here, I'll, I'll be right back. Thanks. Mary? Yes. Here's an absolutely off topic question. But you, because you're retired, right? Uh, military retired? Yes. So, you know, the um, MWR benefits? Yeah. Have you ever used any of the vacation stuff, like going to the place in Hawaii or any of those things? No, I haven't. Um, but I also looked at um, not only MWR, but there's um, an Armed Forces Vacation Network. Yeah, the like that Gov Vacation or something. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't used MWR. No. Have you um, used the Gov Vacations? No, no, I haven't. Used, but I looked at that. Yeah. Um, so. Because I was looking at MWR, I had a friend, friend who, because they've got like a five star hotel in Honolulu. Yeah. But then they also have these like casitos up by. Um, Oh God, the Air Force Base in, on Oahu, uh, Schofield Barracks. Yeah. And they evidently have a whole area there where there's like little studio and one and two bedroom with kitchen places right on the beach on a private little beach. Oh, wow. I know that I was thinking, and she said that's fabulous there. I've just never, I haven't heard anybody else who's done it. Yeah, I have, and I would guess you would just need a... Yeah. Um, so I know they have... The, the other deal is in, you know, it's near bases and stuff, but it, they have uh, one-month rentals, like in Italy and Naples, and like one-month apartments that are <laughs> dirt cheap. Really? So, yeah, but I, I haven't, yeah. We just never got a chance to really travel. Yeah, to re yeah look around yeah. and see look around and see everything so uh, yeah well if you do let me know because yeah when i keep getting emails from that gov vacations and there's some really good deals there also yeah you go on vacation I don't, I don't know if that's just military or if it's military and federal employees or what but yeah um I don't know why I'm carrying right now. It's not like I can go anywhere, but. We can go places. Huh? We can go places. Yeah. I'm excited. I got to Home Depot. <laughs> yeah, I have a Home Depot run tomorrow. Mm. We did one today. Well, I did it. My husband. <laughs> Look at this. It's all like, oh, Home Depot. I'm bad at that pastor for dying in Arkansas. That makes me really angry. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just irresponsible, irresponsible of the whole congregation. What the hell are you doing? Inside, the, Inside. Pastor, the pastor died. He was a young right. man, only 50. And they decided to have the church service inside during a pandemic in a state that has very low vaccination right. rates with no masks with a bunch of elderly people yeah yeah i mean that's just that's ridiculous i'm, I'm mad i'm, I'm just mad I mean, that, that i mean it could have killed my aunt it might still because she's just really weak and uh, just, i mean if, if you really are that deep into you do you think god's going to protect you because of what you're doing give it up dude. obviously didn't her husband got uh um the infusion were, and that was really nice to hear that their uh, their hospital had all that set up, but he was able to get an infusion, which made him sick. I mean, he's still sick, but not as bad, but she couldn't but get it because they what? said she was too sick. It's that Rosetavir or whatever it's Oh, called. yeah. Wow. They, they hook it up and they give you a bunch of shots and stuff like that, and, and it's supposed to catch people who are not yet really sick. But, um, you know, and it's kind of one of those thoughts. It's like, should I get this even though, yeah. or should I wait it out and see if I'm going to get really sick? But man, this thing would have killed my, my aunt and uncles like, like that if they hadn't been vaccinated. And just, Especially when you're in that age bracket. I mean, they're like the vulnerable. Yes. I, but, okay. I got to let go. But if, All right. So I think not. I'm ready. So okay. today... I am going to talk about... <laughs>
<laughs> Today, I'm going to talk about how travel and modes of travel affected our ancestors, both in the past and our more recent ancestors. Uh, there's a lot written about early migration routes in the United States, colonial roads and things like that. And we'll talk about those because it's especially in relation to Tamberley's ancestors and to um, <coughs> Susan's mother's side that had people back that far. But I was wanting to figure out a way to make it relevant to you, Mary, and to Deirdre, because your people didn't come until much later. And then I had this epiphany moment when I remembered that when Mary, Jeanette, my Mary, went to college in Boston, people said to me, how can you let her go all the way to Boston? And so you guys are frozen to me, but can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, all right. So, um, so people asked me, how could I let her go all the way to Boston? And I explained to them that once I myself realized that it was only whatever it was, a six or eight hour airplane ride right. and not six months by covered wagon, then, you know, it was okay. And that's when I realized that transportation modes change and allow different means of travel and access and variety in our lives. Yeah. And so what I can say to Mary and Deirdre is that we'll get to some ideas for you guys. So it affected the lives of our ancestors through the generations as transportation. So for example, in my case, I mean, Mary flew to college, but 30 years ago, not 30, 30 years earlier than her, I went to college on a Greyhound bus from Concord suburb of San Francisco to San Francisco State. And, you know, maybe people's parents would drive them, but basically you went to college in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's lots of colleges to choose from, so that was good. But people didn't go across the country to college. And even going back another generation, like in Pat's sister's family, or, you know, they all went to school in Ohio, and I don't know how they got there, train or bus, but, you know, it was a whole different, different thing. So we're gonna talk today about how travel methods affected our ancestors. And this matters because where they came from and where they ended up and where they stopped along the way is where you may find records because births and deaths and marriages occurred at the home place, at the later place, along the way if they stopped for a while to earn money to keep going. So it's not just a cut and dry, oh, they're from such and such a place in Ohio. You're not gonna find all the records there because they actually maybe came from Massachusetts or something. Pennsylvania. Or Pennsylvania as Pat says, Pat's back there being part of the Phoenix Tower. So you also need to pay attention because I'm going to give you homework for next week. Oh, we're cool. Yay. Yes. Okay, so we're gonna start with early transportation that affected Susan. And I will try to do this sharing thing again that I botched last time, but we'll see. Okay, screen share. And I want... Yeah, it's, I'm looking for... I'm looking for my, no, it's not there kind of thing. What I, where I want to go is to my homepage. 
So how do I get to my home page from here? Oh, down here. I have to do this, I think. We'll try this. Oops. Okay. So nope, that isn't what I want. I want my desktop. Okay, just a minute. I need some logistical figuring out. Okay, can you guys see my desktop? Nope. No. Nope. Mm -hmm. Get your document out of this. Okay, I got that. That's the document I want. Okay. Now what? Now go back to Zoom. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, you can um, go back to Zoom. Uh -huh. I don't think that's the right button to get to Zoom. Uh, where's, your, where's your screen? How come it's not showing? That's terribly. Um, sorry, guys. I thought I could easily get to my home screen from where I was. Okay. Just a minute. I drive. No, I love it. I don't. Usually, I've lost. I go to my screen, and there's a thing down in the corner that will take me right back to where. I, I know, was. right there. Huh. All right, I'll put that down there. But I don't see this. Yeah. Click it. Okay. There you are. All right, now we're going to try screen share again. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go. <coughs> so you want to close this screen because you don't want anything on there, right? Right. So I'm going to close that. Mm -hmm. And I put it down here. There it is. Okay, I can. Okay, sorry. Click up here to get full screen. There. All right. So, so I can't read what that says down there, but it, it says major rivers, roads, and canals. Maybe I can't read. 18, 25, 25 to 1860. We're still not so, screen shared. Pardon me? We don't see a screen. You don't see a screen? Nope. Did you go to screen share? Or did you yeah, I, I thought I did. I went to screen share. Okay. That document that you're looking for is right. Should have come up. Well, it's right here. Oh. Can you see it now? Nope. No, you have to click on it and then hit share. What? Share. She started. Oh, share. hit share. No, that's not it. That's not it. That's not what I want. Could you move your mouse around, maybe? And it'll pop up the share screen. Okay, here, let me, let me, let me do that. Please. Okay, your share screen. Right. Now, this is not there. No, go, it's there. It's right there where that orange button is. Okay. Okay, you got that much, huh? Okay. All right, let me go here. Let me go here. All right, can you see that? Yep. Yes. Okay. All right, so this is showing roads in the 1800s. And this is, I'll go back to that. This is just showing a little bit of up here, which I'll enlarge, but 
Susan especially noticed that there's this road going down south. And that was one of the first ones was along the coast. And then in time, there's some across the, um, the Appalachian area or the, the mountains through South Carolina. And I'll show you that later. So this is again, closer up. And you can see that there's all sorts of roads and just different things that the country, across the country. But I'm gonna go here because, um, and, and this is an area that I worked in, but the roads that were created um, followed old Indian trails or went along the rivers. And if you will notice in your geography that rivers often form the boundaries between states and counties. And early roads inland, especially like to Pennsylvania, were military. The Broderick Road and the Forbes Road went to Fort Duquesne, Pittsburgh area, mm -hmm. became, which became Pittsburgh. And rivers and roads together would allow for transporting people to inland areas to settle, but it would also allow for goods to be able to go back and forth. Let's see if I have a better Pittsburgh one. No. So if you, this is back one and it is hard to see, but here's Philadelphia and then the roads are going this way to Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then once you got to Pittsburgh, you could go on the Ohio River and you know find all sorts of ways. So in the early 1800s, the steamboat became commercially successful. It was actually invented before that. Fulton wasn't the inventor, but he was the first one to make it commercially feasible. And what the steamboat could do was go against the current right. of a river. So for example, going up the Hudson River was going against the current. And then the canal, the 18, in 1825, I think it was, the Erie Canal was built. So somebody could be in New York, go up the Hudson River on a steamboat, get on the Erie Canal on a boat, go across through the lakes, and then over to Ohio and down to Pittsburgh and to the rivers, or even come up around and go to Illinois. There's lots of ways. Once you were on the Ohio River, you could also then go to the Mississippi River. So people also walked. Um, family what? story in my family is that the people that were one of the younger ones that was from the Finger Lakes re region walked across mm -hmm. the Niagara River at Niagara Falls and then walked down Lake Erie to Detroit area. Walked? Walked. Yeah. Like with their belongings? Well, that's what they used to do. Yeah. People so they the walk story. Did. The Mormons walked with their carts. All right, what have I got? Not like, I, I always thought of the, it is more of like a, let's walk to that mountain. Okay, let's stay and hang out there for a while. Okay, let's walk to the next mountain. Okay, let's stay and hang out. Well, they might have. But no, my ancestors walked from New Hampshire to Ohio and then back again. Why? Because that's how you got there. There wasn't other transportation. I mean, the roads were very good. And Certainly weren't cars, so you know, a horse and wagon or something like that. Maybe they didn't have the financial needs means for even that. And some of these people, they would walk to the river, and then they'd have to build their boat to go on the river. Man, we think we got it bad, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so this is Ohio territory, 
And this was a lot of the land in Ohio came from a variety of sources. I've talked about this before, but one of the things that happened was the national road and it went from someplace in Maryland to Illinois. And it went right through the area of where your people were, yeah. um, Kimberly. And it was built 1818 to 1838. First section was 1818. So I don't know when it got to your wow. area. Wow. Okay. And that made things easier. And this was a federal program. And Susan, there was also a, another federal road down in the south, which I'll show you in, in a little bit. So Is that if you that western part of it or the eastern part of it along the canal that goes from like Pittsburgh to Washington DC over the Cumberland Gap? I wonder. I don't know. Yeah, I mean I do know that, yeah. that there was some things where they they jury rigged up. Yeah. Yeah. Over the Appalachians. And there was a Pittsburgh, uh, you know, in Pennsylvania, I was talking about the Braddock Road and the Fords Road, and that is like along that southern part of Pennsylvania. So I have a thing about canals I'll show you in a bit, maybe that'll answer it. But you can see all these became, you know, capitals and, and see how straight it is compared yeah. to Indian paths and stuff like that. And we know the national road is Highway 40 today, which is part of the you know interstate highway system that goes well across the country. I mean, it, I don't precisely know where it goes, but I do know it goes across northern Arizona on your way to Grand Canyon and all those areas. So, okay. Okay, so here's some Southern stuff for you, Susan. So here's up here at Philadelphia. And like I said, there was this coastal route. And then these two over the mountain routes came. And pretty soon they're adding more. And the reason they needed to really get to here was because they needed mail to go from Louisiana to Washington, D.C. Because remember, Louisiana was also a, a, um, a port. And there's Indian country in here. And there's, I only could read bits and pieces. There's a lot to the story about the roads going through the Indian country. And this has to do with the Creek Indians. Um, but here's your Carolinas and then goes over to, you know, Georgia and Arkansas and Alabama. Um, does that have a date on there? New Orleans to Washington, 1806. There's lots of stuff here. I'm going to come back to these in a minute. Is that the same one? Yeah, it probably is. Furry version of it. Okay. So let me see what else I wrote here. When Cindy, when when you say roads, what, what would they be looking at? Are these just dirt paths or? Like one car, like one, one lane, so this one, like what we would call a lane. Now. You know, I don't know, but yeah, it wasn't anything. But there was toll roads at a certain point, and those were better roads. They had, you know, basis. And this was later, but you know, where there was a a rock bed, not rock, but a bedrock kind of thing. And, but those were private roads and they were much easier to work on, but they were toll roads, which is part of toll roads. They're part of the system. Yeah. So Pat was going to say something. What were you going to say? Uh, oh, Pat says a lot of the toll roads were plank roads. The woods. Planks? Out of wood. Built on really? Wood. Yeah. 
That would be hard to maintain, wouldn't it? People would probably try to still That's why they were told roads to be able to do that. Oh. There is a museum outside of Zanesville, Ohio, um, the National Road Museum that's fascinating. Just fascinating if you ever get there. So in more modern times, we also talk about train travel and car travel and plane travel. So Mary, when your people came to Pennsylvania, train travel was a big deal. Um, Pat's aunts would talk about taking in, you know, I don't even know when, 1920s or 30s, taking the train from their little town. They walked to the, the Y and then take the train into Punxsutawney, which was the big town. Six, oh. six ways in it, they're walking. Yeah. But was... train travel was the more modern way. And, you know, I asked Pat when he um, moved to, from Zanesville, to Salinas, where his family was, how did he get there? Well, he got there by bus. So, you know, train travel and then bus travel. And airplane travel is now ordinary, but I was thinking back to when, in the 50s and the 60s, when I was growing up, at least in my world, very few people flew in an airplane. It was, you know, an exotic thing, maybe rich people or business people. I mean, maybe more people flew than I know, but it wasn't common. And yet by 1978, we took a trip to New York City for a vacation. And that was my first airplane ride. Um, and that was, you know, pretty ordinary. And then Mary flew to Boston in 95. When we moved to Berlin in 58, we went on a steamship. Really? But a year oh, later, we flew, we flew back because it, because it was time to get out of Berlin quickly, but it was really cost prohibitive too. Did you take the Did you take it by ship the first time because you had so much stuff to take with you? And it just might no, have been it was a fam family of six and not a lot of money, and it's a really long flight. And the cheapest way was to take a passenger liner. But when we flew back, my dad had to stay there, and we were flying back to get out because the conflict was starting up. So we took a 26 hour prop plane. Yeah. You remember it? No, I was only two. I don't, I don't know if my dad took a ship back or a plane. He probably took a ship back because it was just him. But my mom and the kids, we left before the wall went up. Right. Could have walked. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's like the decisions people make depends on the mode of transportation. Um, it never would occur to somebody that a car would be invented where they could just get on these roads and within a matter of hours be across three or four states that, you know, took, I don't know how long on a wagon or a horse or, you know, maybe they had to stop somewhere for a while and earn some money working in a field or a carpenter shop or something. I mean, it's, it's just like a whole different set of decisions. And like I said, it really matters because they didn't quickly go from place A to B. They created documents in more than one place. If you can't find, you, you've got a family and you know they have gotten married and look at the census and children are born in different states and you know it could be that they had to travel or where was the marriage? Well, maybe in the first place, wherever that was. You know, so um, that's just a kind of a brief overview of what I wanted to say in it. It was difficult because I, I have this really good book, but I couldn't read a lot of the details. So the, the book is called, I'm gonna go out. No, I'm not gonna go out because I'm afraid it'll, it's called um, Map Guide to American Migration Routes. And it's by William 
dollar hide. D-O-L-L-A-R-H-I-D-E. And it's got these, you know, some of these that I printed. There's the National Road, for example. The camera is over there. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm holding that up to where I can do pat points up the camera's over there. Anyway, can you see? Sort of, yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, I looked up to, to be able to tell you to buy it. And it turns out that it's very expensive to buy. Uh, it is available on Ancestry. And I think it was like 24 or $36 or something like that for this basically 30 page, 40 page book that I got for- I can, you, can you read off the title again? The title is Map Guide to American Migration Routes by William Dollarhide. Well, if you think of it, the Transcontinental Railway wasn't even until the, what, late 60s? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Yes, and yet it's not that big of a deal train travel now. Yeah. You know, less than so. Um, now, I'm going to go back to the beginning of these. And for, um, what's it called? Where you're not supposed to pass on things that are copyrighted. I'm not going to give you copies of these, but I might linger on a page if you thought you might get your cell phone out and want to take a screenshot or something. Um, <laughs> because the homework assignment. Because like I said, it was difficult for me to get this much together. And so I'm going to give each of you a particular thing to do. Now, if you can't do it, you can't do it. But Tamberly, I would like you to explore more about canals. And I thought I had a canal picture in here. Let me see. Maybe I didn't get it copied over. Looks like I didn't get it copied over. Uh, maybe I'll linger on that some other way. <laughs> I'm not going to find it. Um, but I'd like you to learn more about the canal stuff in Ohio and Pennsylvania in particular, but you know, canals in general, but especially how they might relate to your family's travels. So, how they did what to road travel? How they influenced road travel? No, related to your family. Like how oh. your family might have used canals oh. in Pennsylvania and Ohio. Remind me to find that picture for you. It's on one of my other um, things. Okay, Susan, I would like you to study more about the Southern routes. And I could linger. On that one, if you were so inclined. Got it. Okay. And I don't know if this is exactly the same. Let's see what that one says. It might be the same. This one, just to, I don't know if it's the same. Um, I don't know, Tamberly, if you want the National Road because that might connect to the canals too. Um, so Mary, are you still with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, I was hoping that you might learn something about train travel. And because I think it would work with your Pennsylvania people having arrived, they came like 1900, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure that they took, trains because well my family moved um this is different sides pennsylvania new york connecticut new jersey all over yeah. the place. So, so how did they travel was it trains what what was traveling yeah. by train like how long did traveling by train we we know it didn't really get going until like 1850 1860 but you know how long did it remain in travel um I'm not sure when buses came in, that might factor into what you're doing. 
What? They're seated by stage coaches. Pat says buses were preceded by stage coaches. Yes, when well, they yeah. went on the routes, that's true. When Mary's relatives certainly would have come from a more of a trained culture in Europe. I mean, if her grandmother lived in Vienna. Right. They yeah. would have been someplace where the train network was much better. Yeah, no, true, very true. Because she did. So Deirdre, if you were here, but I think I can still give it to you by recording. I don't know where your immigrant ancestors landed. Do you guys remember? Was that a New York thing or a someplace else? I thought they just materialized in, in Maury County somehow. Yeah. Yeah. I never heard how they got here. Yeah. It was like a transporter or something. Just Yeah, well, it occurred to me. How did yeah, I don't know if we know how she got there. Yeah, so that's, and I'm not sure she knows. So I, I think that's what her homework is, is to figure out how her people got from New York to the Salinas Valley. What mode of transportation? Did they go someplace else first? What, maybe they didn't even land in New York. Maybe it was someplace, I don't know. I mean, it wouldn't have been San Francisco from Italy. So I'm curious. And when, when did they go? They, they came um, after 1900, is that about right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The Panama Canal was open then. Pat says the Panama Canal was open then. Ooh, that'd be interesting. Hmm. They went through the Panama yeah. Canal. That's it, yeah. I don't know. Um, During Teddy Roosevelt, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then maybe Deirdre, if you have time, you might investigate airplane travel a little bit more. Like, when did it become more common? Um, you know, I mean, now it's just constant, but in the 60s, you know, for me, anyway, in the 70s, it was not a common thing. So when did that happen? So you can use any resource you want, um, Google or Wikipedia or, anything you want, but I did look at Cindy's list. So Cindy's, and this is hard to find, so that's why I printed it out here. Cindy'slist.com slash migration slash maps. So let me see if I can get that one to come up. I might not be able to. We'll see what happens. I got it, if you don't. Okay, well, I wanted to show. Okay, can you guys see this screen? Yep. Okay, so like I said, it was, you would think it would be easy to find and it's under her, you know, migration routes, roads and trails, but it, you have to go around the barn and through the woods to finally get to this. That's why I gave you the link. At Grandma's house, okay. Yes, so there's early trails and roads, much of which we've talked about, Braddock's Road, the Boston Post Road, California Trail, you know, the Fall Line Road um, might be one of those ones that went south. Great Valley Road did. Um, anyway, there's all sorts of things. Here's the National Trail. The Pennsylvania Road, I think Pat might have had one of his ancestors have a tavern along that. Um, but anyway, all some of these things that we've been talking about. And then there's just other things, Ohio migration map and information, lots of things that you guys can find, rails and trails for you, Mary, Seibert, um, okay. you know, um, roads in the South, East United States for Susan and, transportation and settlement in North Carolina. You had Carolinas, right? So anyway, lots of places here to get some information. And I think if you maybe do a 10 minute thing, eight minute thing, you know, not, not a big deal, but especially in relation to your family, that's the whole point. I mean, yes, it's good to know, but you need to be able to apply it. And you know, the only George, only South I have, Susan, is in Georgia. Pat has um, people that were in the North 
east corner uh, for a, a while. Well, one of them for a long time. No, of Georgia. That's where Thomas F. went to live with his older it's brother. Northwest Pennsylvania. Northwest, no, Northeast Pennsylvania. I'm sorry, Northeast Georgia, Northwest Pennsylvania, but also Northeast Pennsylvania and Philadelphia and into Ohio. I mean, between Pat and I, we're practically everywhere. So, um, so this way you can elaborate further. And I just, the only thing I leave to say is, you know, I wonder what future transportation modes will develop and how that will affect our descendants on, you know, what kinds of decisions do they pop off to the Mars colony to get married and have their honeymoon or, you know, I don't know. So, or is it, you know, a, a 20 minute sonic trip to Niagara Falls, who knows? whatever thing, but the point is that the events of people's lives and the records they create matter on location and the transportation is what takes them to those locations. So that's kind of what I have. I don't know if you want to add anything or. That was, that was really interesting. I hadn't thought <laughs> about that before. I'm looking forward to looking at my Southern roads because you know, you just see they're living here and then next they're living there. And you, you don't realize it was, it wasn't, I mean, even, even now, like when I drove up to Oregon, it was like, oh my gosh, I took this long trip to Oregon and I did this and I did that and boy, it was smoky and it was hot. And, you know, you're complaining about your trip and you're talking about it, but can you imagine if your trip took months? <laughs> Yeah, yes. that, that was <laughs> yeah, a freaking amazing. Um, Let me see if I can find that one. You know, I was just thinking about, you know, I wonder, when you said, I wonder what the future holds for us. Just think about how transportation has changed over the years, just with not after 9 11. Now we have all that yeah. security we have to go through, which is that's true. Just crazy amounts of security we're doing. And then this pandemic has changed things again because we seem to be either staying put or you know making the area that we're at more whatever we want it to be or people are because their jobs aren't pulling them in necessarily in some cases to live in a place to live to work you're a large chunk of us are able to do their jobs remotely so what people I guess when my family moved, we moved to get land. Yes. So it wasn't like oppression or uh, any like pushing people being pushed out for religious reasons. It was we want land. Well, I think another like, thing to look at, yeah, but I think another thing to look at too, especially in the early 1800s and travel, a lot of people were moving around too because of the weather. There was a very a colder weather pattern that was going through. Um, in the early 1800s, the year without summer, uh, famines, crops dying, uh, that really affected, you know, a, a lot of people. I hear a future talk by Mary Seibert on this talk discussion. <laughs> I, I hadn't really thought about that um, until I read that um, letter on the Jerry Andrus uh, of why his family left Wyoming. Remember, they had a horse farm. And then, yeah, it's, then well, and the weather is is cyclical. Killed it's, killed off all the cyclical. livestock. During the, yeah, during the during the um, early eighteen hundreds, um, we went through a solar minimum, which it was colder, but it also triggered volcanic activities, floods. It just cascades into different weather phenomena that really affected people and they didn't have, you know, the technology and infrastructure that we have now. Can you imagine floods and famines and whatnot washing oh, the out whole dust bowl. Oh yeah, yeah the dust well, bowl for sure. Yeah. That was true. Yeah. Because you're Tam, looking at it now, yeah. Tam, really, you might linger over this one. In other words, get your phone out and take a picture of it. Hurry up. 
the uh, I was thinking of also okay. climate change and how that's changing. Just like Mary said, it's, yeah. I wonder if more people are we're going to start seeing an influx of people moving away from the water edges more in inland. Maybe the areas like Mary Scott, where the rain doesn't really bother you as much. It just kind of no California wildfires. People are there will moving. be more. There will be more floods, like the floods yeah. happened in Tennessee, where ten people were, fifteen people were killed, and they still haven't found people. These flash floods that are popping up because of these weather anomalies. Germany too. Germany climate change makes me really appreciate where we live. That's for sure. With a great weather that's in Salinas yeah. Valley, and um, you know we have wildfires around us, but not really here. Right. It's nice. I just remember being out there at Christmas time, and it was in the sixties, and I was loving it. So yeah. <laughs> weather. Come on out, Mary. Come again. Love to have you out here. You come visit, and we'll have a party for you. Yes. I want yes, to come flowers. out when you have all the flowers out in front of your house. <laughs> well, we have flowers all the time. Just different kinds of flowers. We do yeah. have parties here in this block. Yeah, we have parties in this block. Mary, yeah. think, thinking about you and bicycles. Yeah. So that canal that ran from um, Pittsburgh to Washington, D.C. Yeah. That, that goes up over the Eastern Continental Divide. Yeah. It's like a five to seven day. What they did is they took what used to be the mule road where the mules pulled the, 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 mouth, the yeah. canal, and that's a bike trail now. Yeah. Yeah. It's supposed to be fabulous. It's like a seven day ride or something. And if you do it west to east, the last three days are downhill. Ooh, Ooh cool. Ooh. We'll have I was going to do that with my brother. It looks like fun. Yeah, we would do it. Yeah, we're definitely. Already uh, planning. That says that Angie and John, oh, his, his sister Angie and her husband, did part that part of that. That's what he says. Yeah, yeah. Mary, you'll have to ask. I'm looking at Sean. Sounds like yeah, they did. Yeah. I think they did the downhill part. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I went back. I had I did a lecture for uh, a group in Syracuse, New York. And I'm wandering around trying to figure out what to do with myself, my downtime. And they took one of the one of the people who was housing me took me to a Syracuse, New York museum, and it was on the Erie Canal. I mean, at the, at the 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 canal they're talking about. I'd never heard of it before. Um, I took a bunch of pictures. I really enjoyed the museum. It's one of my favorite places to go. But I'd forgotten about it. I'm going to go back and look through my notes and my uh, my photos. I'm looking at the photos right now that it was, they talked a lot about the, you know, how it caused a lot of settlements in the area and that's how they got their goods and to the area. But the thought is, is that they kind of filled it in and I never really, I don't remember what the answer was. Why did they mostly fill it in? Because it seems like well, yeah. trains, trains and roads, and it eliminated the need to pull boats along the canal. It wasn't financially yeah. viable anymore. I think like parts train. are open still for, for pleasure boats and stuff like that. Trains aren't financially doing very well because, yeah. you know, cars and airplanes. Well, for freight, freight, they're good. I think they're starting to become popular again. Trains. See, I think... I think my um, wood people that are from the Finger Lakes area of New York, they came to Michigan in 1827 and that canal, Erie Canal was opened in 1825. So I think they came that way because there was a whole family. I got a mule yeah. and her name is Sal. Yeah, is there some song about the Erie Canal? Yeah, 18 yeah. miles of the Erie Canal. Yes. Oh, He's a good old worker and a good old pal. Yes. Everybody down. <laughs> and, and, and in England, I mean, not knowing other countries, but in England, there are still canals with people that tread them. We, we saw that. Yeah, in so. France, too. Okay. Yeah. So. And I hear there's one between at the base of... Um, Central America between South America and Central America. Oh, <laughs> oh, the Panama Canal. <laughs> it's 
sorry. <laughs> Big one. I've been there. <laughs> I've been I there. really want to go see that. I really it's really cool. It really is. Apparently, I went to a zoo when I was back there, and I don't remember going to the zoo in Syracuse. <laughs> I'm looking at pictures right now, and I've got some awesome pictures, but I don't. It was 2017. How do how have I forgotten this already? <laughs> a lot has happened. Oh. Anyway, so that's kind of what I have, and and. So I'm trying to figure out a way for Mary and Deirdre to be involved in it. And I, there's a lot more you, you, Tamberly and Susan, that you guys can get on Colonial Roads. That was big. I mean, that whole book is written. There's lectures, all sorts of things. But it just, when, when I thought about Mary Jeanette, I went, oh, her life is different because of airplanes. Yeah. And that's how all of our ancestors over time changed things and now people can just pop over to Reno and get married and or they don't get married or they don't get married That's yeah the letters my mom wrote to my dad whenever he was in Reno getting his divorce and she was still here uh when she finally got to the point where he was going to get divorced and it was going to be obvious she started looking up the bus schedules and she called <laughs> called up the bus schedules Mm -hmm. and um to get up to reno i'm dying to do a, a train trip you know really nice i want to go through the snow mm -hmm. i want a sleeper car I, i'm dying to do that i want to go through canada i think it'd be so much fun to go through the snow in the can in canada everyone says you don't go the whole way across canada though you either do the eastern or the western but the center is nothing but a whole lot of nothing yeah, yeah i think that's what i heard too is that you do part and then you fly to the next or something i want to go do the one in russia the trans-siberian oh yeah to do. I'd love Ooh, to go. Be a murder on that one it's like <laughs> there's always going to be a murder on there Ooh. well we could take the train um that goes across the country it leaves out of oakland near oakland and take it as far as salt lake city see all the really good stuff and then get off at Salt Lake City and spend a couple of days at the library there. And then either take the train home or fly home. Well, city has got a, got a road trip. A field trip, yeah. Set up for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I well, Amtrak has pulled back all their dining car service. Oh, oh look yeah. who's showing up. They serve microwave meals now. They don't have the oh, regular, you know, chef on board like they used yeah. to yeah hello hey, look who's here hey <laughs> yeah i would have been here talking it's about you <laughs> that's why my ears are burning you've got homework oh so yeah. the first homework is you got to watch this video to find out what your homework is oh yeah. okay <laughs> so we <laughs> talked about travel and really probably best to just listen to the whole thing okay but then i fine. gave everybody homework based on what i know of their ancestry in relation to travel modes and stuff okay you hear it all but and i told you what yours was too oh. but i have a question for you okay your immigrant ancestors on both sides did they land in new york yes and how okay and where did they go from there um they went to california okay <laughs> i told you they just transported i said that. oh, oh you anything. wanted to know how like by train or yes you know? that's your homework that's one of your homeworks oh, okay to figure out how they got from new york to salinas valley yeah no i was thinking when you were at, i'm like if she's going to ask how, I don't know how they did that. How, <laughs> no, so that in your talk, did you explain how I can find this out? Uh, no. We no. talked about some ideas of what okay. kinds of things were available in the early 1900s. Okay. And then, then yes, and Cindy's list, I put up a... Um, which you didn't see. Is it? No, it's on, it's on the video. Oh, it's okay. on the video. And okay. transportation things, including train, about trains. 
I, I am curious about that. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe your parents know, you know, maybe, okay. but so that's part of your assignment. And then the other part of your assignment is we were talking about, um, and you'll hear all this, but I had this epiphany moment. I wanted to make it relevant to you and Mary because a lot of stuff is written, you know, from earlier uh, about the colonial roads and the history of travel and stuff. And I was trying to figure out how to do it. And I realized my Mary Jeanette went to college in Boston. And people said to me, you know, how can you let her go so far? And I was like, well, once I realized it was only a six or eight hour airplane ride and not six months by covered wagon, <laughs> it was okay. And then that's when I hit me that transportation has changed over time from colonial roads and Indian pathways and how that affects. So you're, everybody kind of has something to do relative to their family, but I thought maybe besides finding out how your people got there, maybe you could explore about plane travel a little okay. bit. So- Oh, I'm quite sure they didn't take a train. I mean, a plane. <laughs> no, no, nobody would have then, but yeah. <laughs> later, how come? Uh -huh. How come we went from hardly anybody flying to everybody flying? You know, what happened? But it's all in the video. Okay. Susan recorded. So yeah, it'll it'll after I hang up, then it formats for about an hour or so. Okay. As, as Zoom has to format the uh, the video and then it takes me, then I put it up on YouTube and then it takes about an hour from there. So about three hours we should if, if all goes well, you should be able to see the video. That's fine. Okay. Mary, are you having technical difficulties? Yeah, my, my internet was really crappy, so I just shut my um, camera off. Mm. And it's, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> we could hear her better. I mean, we could hear her now, but when she had video and audio, it was, it was, it was horrible. Crazy. Is that just because it takes less bandwidth? I oh, guess. Yeah. I guess so, yeah. I don't. Yeah. It seems to work. That's all we've learned. Yeah. Do more. Turn it off the video. Yeah. So did you guys wrap up then? Is that what? We're, That's we're what just, when you walked in. Yeah. Just as we were, we were kind of finishing. People were talking about different experiences in travel. It was really interesting. You'll you'll like this video. It's it's um. It, it makes me really think. You know about. Well, you'll see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't repeat myself so much. Well, I, I didn't take, don't know. I took a whole page of notes. Oh, oh good. And Pat, but, uh, Pat here throwing two cents in. He has something else to say. What? A lot of those railroad tracks and hotels that. Uh, well, say it to them so they can hear. Well, you're being quiet. Come along, here. Along the railroad tracks, there were hotels. And you'll, you'll if you stay in there, they, they, what, what would they call it? There's, there's that one we stopped at. Yeah. Uh, right. I know where you mean. I can't remember. Way stations or. I don't know. It was the name of a guy. But, oh. Uh, at any rate, uh, those were along the railroad, but way before that, there were inns along the, the right. uh, roads that people would, would stay in. Some of those inns are still there. Uh, mm. And uh, they're historic. They're historic places now. Like stage or they were just places where people along who were traveling along the road would stop. Coach houses and what have you. Mm -hmm. Oh, and so, even our train station here in Salinas is historic because it was made during the Art Deco period, I think. Yeah, if you go in and take take pictures inside that the waiting room. There's some really gorgeous uh, parts in there. Yeah. So those are WPA, the WPA uh, murals. Yeah, WPA stuff too. Mm -hmm. That's true. So I was thinking about not only did these roads and train stations and so on build our, our America up by you know placing places for people to stop, but it also where it didn't go dried up towns absolutely there's a lot of areas that were prosperous for whatever reason maybe maybe coal or 
or gold or who knows something and then the train didn't go to their area and well the same thing with didn't the freeways them. right mm -hmm. they built a freeway that bypasses a. I mean morgan hill used to be the throughway right and then they built the bypass and now you have to go to morgan hill for a purpose you mean like blood alley yeah <laughs> oh god i remember that ter that terrified me when i was a teenager i thought would we have to go to Blood Alley to get there? Because it was scary. Pacheco Pass. Oh my gosh, that was war. Even Prunedale, just going through yeah. the, just as one of one just recently. And a lot of kids, of course, wouldn't know that. The other thing I was thinking about is what Cindy said. If it takes a long time to get from place A to place B, you may have a child born on mm -hmm. route. Um, oh. I was just thinking of the Afghan, uh, uh, how the one was baby was yeah. born on the plane as on the a plane. plane. Yes. <laughs> They're calling it. Yeah. Calling it uh the baby's name is um named after the call it. sign of the plane, which is oh it's it's like return or regress or something some word like that. It starts with an R, you know, short little vowel that you don't even think of. Huh. But it's that's the name of the child because mm -hmm. it's the call sign of the plane that was evacuating them. Mary might understand more. I don't know. Re, re, repeat, re, regress, re, re, return, not return. <laughs> retro, hmm? retro, regrade, oh. something like that. Yeah, it's probably you'll see it now and you'll go, oh, that's what Susan was talking about. Yeah, the it didn't even have a gender sound on it. You don't know if the point gender just happened? Oh. a few days ago. Oh, yeah. well, I just read that they made they they said that the baby had been born on as the evacuation, and then today or yesterday I I read that the the baby has a name and they've released the baby's name. Huh. It's call sign the call sign of the plane. I I don't know what that would be. Okay, reach. all right, all right. Let me just do it real quick. Uh, reach, reach. That's her name. <laughs> reach. Reach. <laughs> Baby F G A J N I S T A N born on flight on plane. Okay, let's see. Are yeah, I want like to watch new news, read no newspapers. I mean, I know basically what's going on, but today was really bad. Yeah, they had a uh, uh bombing they said that on the news they said that, that when the taliban came in they released everybody out of the prisons and some of the people right. who were in the prisons were real yeah. extreme yeah, and some of the know. taliban was killed in this bombing they didn't want this to happen it was a, uh, it was some third party kind of thing so did you hear that about that i didn't know there was 12 uh, marines 11 marines and a soldier mm -hmm. killed and another 15 injured Ah, the baby's name is Reach. Spell it. R E A C H. Reach. Name the baby Reach. Like it's the plane's call sign. I heard so this was a suicide bomber. Suicide bomber. Um, Derby. So he'll be on the news tonight. It's just really awful. I guess it's a better name than air transport or something like that. Yeah, no, reach. That sounds like a pretty cool name to have. I kind of like it. Yeah, well, it's better than uh, C17 or whatever. <laughs> Is it a boy or girl? Girl. Oh, girl. girl. And you can't talk for the name. But that's really interesting. Reach. Uh, yeah. and she was born on a C17 military aircraft during the evacuation flight from Afghanistan. She's named after the plane's call sign. I didn't know. What is this about call signs? What's that mean? Well, have you seen In the Heights? Yeah. No. Well, when it was at the, I saw it when it was at the Hartnell. Yeah, and the guy's name is Uznavi. I don't remember that. Because his dad looked at the ship in the harbor and it was US Navy on it. So the, <gasps> he named his kid Uznavi. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Well, you, you know the joke, don't you? About the, the, the fellow whose uh, um, sister had twins. And he went to see them. And he said, through, 
in, in, afterwards, people asked him, well, what, what did they name him? And he, says, he said, Denise. And then they said, well, what did they name the other one? Oh, the nephew. <laughs> <laughs> so here's here's just here's a little more information. It says that uh, the mother and the father were birthed both on the plane. It's the only one actually born in an evacuation flight. There was two other babies who were born, but they were born in hospitals after um, being evacuated. Uh, it says that they decided to reach to name her Reach because the transport aircraft's call sign is Reach Eight Twenty Eight, and she was born Saturday. The 86 medical group helped in the birth as a plane flew from Cabal to Romstein Air Base in Germany. Dead, yeah. It says that the mother went into labor during the flight and began experiencing complications due to low blood pressure. The pilot descended in altitude to increase air pressure in the aircraft, which helped stabilize the mother. Wow. Military medical personnel delivered the baby in the baby's cargo bay, and they said they're all in good condition. And that is just what a story. <laughs> yeah, really. I expect great things from Baby Reach. <laughs> exactly. She huh. better go on and do some. I want to be alive <laughs> to hear her on whatever is the equivalent of the mainstream media in the future. And yeah. she, or she's running for some kind of something and she'll be able to say, my life story. <laughs> and I and got my story. To, when she gets older, she'll go as Riosh. <laughs> <laughs> or her mill is her middle name 828 <laughs> just call me just call me eight <laughs> you could call me 828 828 that's her it's just so funny but I, I, it's an afghan child so it wasn't like an american that was being evacuated and had um Okay, her child, so now is she like stateless or yeah i wonder what citizenship she would have i guess i wonder what the citizenship is for for afghan people if they always or have they name. end up being refugees i guess they have to apply for citizenship wherever it is oh who could turn down a baby reach i know on the <laughs> that plane. i know and that's interesting that they had the air pressure was so bad that they had to lower the plane lower the, that's, that's really cool in the cargo bay of, oh, I was born, and the, the kid is going to be like, I am so sick of tired of telling this story. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think that's fine. Reach. I don't know. I, I think I think they could have come up with something better than Reach. Did anyway, you the email I sent like just a few minutes before one. Susan, sent yeah, about uh, barbecue. But I, I, they finally emailed me back, and they said they canceled it because of the COVID e increase in COVID. We appreciate that. Yeah. So I know, but 12. I thought how fun and they have such delicious tri-tip barbecue there. Oh my gosh. Where's this? At the um, Monterey County Historical Society. And oh. you know, they usually, you know, let you go in and um, everything is open and yeah. for a tour, yeah. But they, they canceled it. Huh? Yeah. Maybe they could should just move it to January or something. There's they like, said it, it, they're planning a lot of things in 22. But I mean, we're tick tocking closer and closer to 22s. And yeah, yeah. It, it's it, it's like the wedding season. Everybody in funeral season, everybody's well, not funeral season. There's no season for funerals. But I mean, everybody's like, I'm postponing it till when it's over. <laughs> it's like. Why? So after, after this finally is over, we're going to have, you know, a, <laughs> we're going to be like, okay, you're invited to six weddings on this weekend <laughs> <laughs> and four uh, remembrances of somebody. And yeah. we're going to be like, okay, 15 minutes at this wedding, 15 minutes at that wedding, because everybody's going to be putting it off. I don't yeah. know. Interesting. Anything you want to tell us, Deirdre, since we've been yakking yeah. for a while? Um, yeah, you have show no, and tell. I haven't. I didn't do. You have show and tell for us. Anything. No. How was Tahoe? Were you guys in heavy smoke? Yes, it was terrible. I, I and talking about travel, I, honestly, I just don't. I don't know where I would go. Although in October, Tom and I, it's our thirty-six. Oh my gosh, anniversary! We're 
<laughs> yeah, we're gonna go to the Ronald Reagan Museum. I mean, we're just staying at a Best Western in Simi Valley, then going to the Ronald Reagan Museum, then going to, uh, oh wait, Solving, and then uh -huh. going home. So you're driving. Like, yeah, we're just driving. Ugh. I mean, which is fine, but I just don't know that I would go anywhere on vacation, literally, because yeah, the smoke was bad. Yeah. And I don't mean bad, I mean hazardous to your health bad. And so our daughter that lives in Salinas, is her and her husband and her daughter went home on Wednesday. Did they? Yeah, they came. Just because it wasn't a healthy place to be. No, and she's pregnant. And then uh, the husband, he, when he was younger, had asthma and he said his chest felt tight. And they had brought one air purifier with them and they left it with us. And, you know, so if we were inside, it was fine. But then, so then our daughter and Reno Sparks and her husband and child came and they didn't want to, she was totally afraid to come, but they brought, anyway, so they stayed two nights. You know, so it, it would be a little better in the morning, mm -hmm. um, and, but it, it would just change so fast. And Was it uh, bad enough that you had to stay inside? Yeah. yeah, what's the point of going on vacation to sit inside? Well, that's it. So Tom's like, well, I'd rather be here inside than at home. It would still be better yeah. as far as a vacation. <clears throat> so it's like, <clears throat> okay, fine. You know, and we had paid for the place. I mean, whatever. But um, then, so Sunday night, even with the air purifier and we shut off rooms that, you know, we weren't in. We woke up in the middle of the night and the smoke started to seep in. And uh -huh. um, and then Tom was like afraid. He's like, no. So we went to Reno Sparks because they have three air filters and purifiers in their house. And and the school was canceled Monday and Tuesday there. So because I mean, we got to the smoke? Because of the smoke. It's like they, they barely started school. You know, they've already had issues with, you know, kids, you know, with COVID. I, it's just like, it's out of, it's ridiculous. I, yeah. I don't know how our poor country, I don't so know how the new work. normal. Yeah. yeah. Because as we have more and more fires <laughs> that makes climate change worse, which brings on more fires. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So really a mess. And so we couldn't go back 50 because it was closed except to local traffic. Right. So, I mean, it wasn't a problem because we were already in Reno. We just went 80, but um, yeah. Well, welcome I mean, back was, to Monterey County. It's beautiful here. Oh my <laughs> gosh. You know, and I really didn't even realize how bad it was until you can breathe the air and you're like, oh my gosh. This is exactly vastly different. You, yeah. I, I noticed that when I was coming back from Oregon, it was you're just oh, driving, yeah. driving, driving, driving. It's so hot, and then it's like I'm home. <laughs> you can roll <laughs> down the windows and breathe, and it's cool, yeah. and it's just the air. You feel like a moisture in it that's not like a hum humid moisture. Yeah. Anyway, no, I, I I don't know how they're going to function in like the Tahoe Reno area i mean they had they had to cancel some flights i mean how, how are these people gonna do it yeah you know, they're gonna have to I, it, it's, it could be you know a month <laughs> i'm just like yeah my daughter's like oh my gosh i wish they would go to zoom i would just come and work remotely from your house and you yeah. could be braille's teacher it's like that'd be awesome but I don't my know. brother's up uh, rafting the rogue river this week and he said it's it, you know they're it's, expecting that it just depends on which way the wind's blowing yeah yeah thinking, yuck because then you're out in it all day all night yeah mary you don't have any problem with fires no no because you have it's wet huh yeah it's kind of a little more wet yeah yeah, yeah. they just have hurricanes and have <laughs> and tornadoes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we have earthquakes some days. We do occasionally have earthquakes. Oh. In a while, knock on wood. <laughs> yeah, that lasts like 
10 seconds. <laughs> oh, we didn't have an earthquake for the last 10 seconds since I knocked on wood. Yeah. All right. I need okay. to get going. I think right. that uh, we are set worth our homework. And so. So next week it'll be. We present our homework. Do, yeah, exactly. All right. I'm excited. I got something to do. That's fun. All right. Yay. Bye all. I'll, put okay. it, I'll send you a link to the, to the video. Okay. Bye.